Thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you, Sebastian. Okay, so we're talking about categorical, categorical data analysis and everything I just said, I'll probably repeat on the next slide. Um, okay, so today um, I'm, I would like, hopefully, um, you to understand the types of analyses that we can conduct with a nominal outcome. Um, and when we have a nominal outcome, we use what's called chi-square statistics. Um, and then I'll go over how to interpret findings from a chi-square test. It's very similar to um, all of the different statistical tests that we've done so far, where we're looking at a p-value um, and, and you know, have that cutoff of 0.05. Um, and then I'll go over logistic regression. Um, it's so it's all so we talked about linear regression when we talked about correlation and we looked at you know simple linear regression in a regression model you can add multiple independent variables um and that's just called a multivariable linear regression um, and they're all in this family called generalized linear models and logistic regression is part of that it's just um the way we um not transform it's there's there's it's called a link function and so in the linear regression model it's just you know there's no link function the for logistic regression we use this what's called a logit um, link um, and I'll go over that a little bit in the slides um, and then we'll talk about how to interpret findings from a logistic regression um, it's a little bit different from linear regression and other regression models that we might use um, and then Let's see. Oh, it says conduct a linear a logistic regression. I go through an example, um, but I don't have code um, for that. We might go over it in exercise five. If not, I'll just have example code for you guys if you want to use it for future reference. Okay. Um, there. Okay. So if you recall, there are four types of data. We have nominal variables, um, and that's looking at mutually exclusive categories. Um, that don't have any order. So handedness, for example, if you're left-handed or right-handed, um, airplane boarding zones is another example. Um, we also use nominal variables for um, epidemiology incidence research. So for example, if we're following individuals to see if they develop a disease. So let's say we're interested in some, um, whether or not um, certain factors are related to the risk of um, cancer, for example. At the end of our study, we can see whether individuals have cancer or do not have cancer. And so we would just code those as a, you know, yes, no. Um, and we can, you know, we consider that nominal as well. Um, and then if you remember ordinal variables, there, there's some inherent order to those categories. So for example, um, placement um, in a, you know, in a competition, um, a Likert scale is also an example of an ordinal variable. Um, and then we have interval. So now these are quantitative variables. They're based on an order and they're equal units of measure. So for example, scored events um, or credit score. And these uh, don't have like a natural zero. So credit score, the range I believe is 300 to 850. So there's no natural zero. And this is in contrast to our ratio variables. Um, where they also are based on order and they're equal units of measure, um, but zero does have meaning. So zero represents an absence of a value. So time or distance, um, weight is also an example. Okay, so that was just a quick review. And then again, as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, before I started the recording, um, up to now, um, all of the analyses we have conducted have in common the distribution of our outcome, right? Or the, the type of variable we have for our outcome. So it's all been continuous up until that point. And then the assumptions of those tests, right? We, we assume that there was normality. Um, we assume that there were not, you know, there weren't extreme outliers. Um, we also looked at how the variants um, you know, like varied. <laughs> so we looked at homoscedasticity. Um, so those are all different things that we um, made assumptions, uh, we assumed about our data before we ran parametric tests. And then if those assumptions didn't hold, um, in most cases, right, so sometimes if we have, you know, not perfectly normal data, or, you know, we have some outliers that don't really heavily influence our results, we can still use parametric tests. 
Um, but if our data are highly skewed or we have very extreme outliers that we want to keep in our data set, then we would use these non-parametric tests. Okay, sorry, I know this is a very busy slide, but I put this on here, so maybe you can like take this slide, I'll put the PDF up, and this is something that you can re reference back, um, refer back to. So remember we talked about t-tests, um, and those are, you, you do have a one sample t-test, but we also have two between subject um, t-tests. So I'm sorry, sorry, that's, a, okay, I'm gonna correct this. For t-tests, we're looking at two levels. So we're looking, comparing means for two levels and they're either independent, so between subjects variable, like men, women, or they're paired. So maybe two points in time um, for every, and everybody was measured at those two points in time. So they're paired. Um, so I'll correct that, this, this between subject here. For ANOVA, it's just kind of an extension, right? It's just looking at um, comparing means um, with three or more levels, and that's the extension of an independent t-test. Um, then we had analysis of covariance, and that's when we have a categorical independent variable, and we also have this continuous covariate. Okay, so we also looked at two-way ANOVA, and that's when we have two between subject categorical independent variables. So maybe we're interested in looking at um, men and women, and then race, ethnicity. So those are the two, you know, um, between subject categorical independent variables. And then this is also referred to as factorial ANOVA. So remember, we can have three-way ANOVA, four-way ANOVA, you know, however many um, independent variables that we have. Um, and then we also talked about repeated measures ANOVA. And that's when we have a within subject independent variable with three or more levels. And that's just the extension of a paired t-test. So let's say we have a group of individuals and we're measuring something um, at three or more points in time, then we would use a repeated measures ANOVA. When we have a mixed ANOVA, we have both between and within subjects categorical factors. Um, okay, so those are all the tests that we talked about, and then we looked at um, correlation, and that's when we have a continuous dependent variable and a continuous independent variable, and then linear regression in its simplest form is the same thing as a correlation, um, but the nice thing with a linear regression model is that we can add additional independent variables of interest. Okay. So if you remember, um, the assumptions for fitting, fitting linear or parametric models is that the observations are independent of each other, except in the case of repeated measures. Um, and there are different types, there is a different type of model for that. And we're actually gonna cover that at the very, very end of um, the semester. Um, since you might need that in your own research, I know a lot of you work with repeated measures. Um, the data points must vary evenly. So that's homoscedasticity. And then there's normality of our residuals. And remember the residuals is just the difference between our observed value and the predicted value. And then we're, that's the residual. And then we're looking at all the different observation residuals for all the different observations and asking whether that's normal or not. Okay. So the chi-square tests, um, there's actually different types of chi-square tests, um, but for our purposes, we're using it to determine whether there's a relationship between two categorical variables. So again, we've been looking at continuous outcomes up to this point. Now we're looking at a categorical outcome. So they just compare the frequency that you observe in certain categories to the frequencies that we might expect. So it's just observed over expected. Um, the model is based on these expected frequencies, and then we can calculate that for each of the cells in a contingency table, and I'll show you what that looks like. So you may have seen something like this. So this is just a two-way chi-square test. It's a, you know, two, we're, we're looking at a two-by-two two table, um, two because each variable um, has two response options. So we have in the independent variable um, group, um, so let's say, you know, male, female, yes, no, um, and then we're looking at response. So let's say, you know, maybe that's disease, yes, no. Okay, so our outcome is the dependent variable, 
and our independent variable um, is this group variable. And both are binary, both are just yes, no. Um, and then again, this is why we call it a two by two table. Um, it could be, you know, we could have group, for example, if it was race, ethnicity, and up until this point, all of our exercises, we've been looking at white, black, Hispanic, other. So we would have four rows so here. So it would just be, in that case, a four by two table. Okay. For the chi-square test, the null hypothesis is that there is no relationship between the two variables, so our group variable and our response variable. And then the alternative hypothesis is that there is a relation that there is a relationship between the variables. Um, and then the degrees of freedom is this: the number of columns minus one times the number of rows minus one. So in our two by two table, the degrees of freedom would just be one. Oh, okay. So we would approach categorical data in, in a very similar way, you know, as we would to continuous data or any other kind of data. Um, and in, in, the, in the example that I gave is very, it's the simplest example where we just have two categorical variables. Oh, thank you. I didn't see that. Okay. Um, let me just let um, Peter in, hold on. Okay. Thanks, Megan. Okay. Um, oops, let me go back up. All right. Okay, so in our two by two table, that is the simplest example where we have two categorical variables with two levels each, but we can have more, more than two categorical variables and we can also have, those variables can also have more than two levels. Um, and unlike the t-test where, you know, if we have more than two levels, now we need to use an ANOVA. Um, if we have more categorical, uh, more than two levels, we can still use a chi-score test. Okay. I feel like I'm missing a slide, but okay. So, well, we talked a little bit at the very beginning about logistic regression. Again, it's still in the family of models called generalized linear models. Um, we use lo logistic regression to predict group membership of a dichotomous or binary dependent variable on the basis of independent variables. So in our logistic regression, we can have a single, so for example, if we were to look at logistic regression, um, like the two by two table, what we would have is as our outcome variable or dependent variable or our Y, that would be group. Um, and then our independent variable or our X would be the response um, variable. So that would be the simplest example of a logistic regression. So um, the nice thing with regression models is we can add additional variables. So if we were also interested in how race, for example, affects risk of disease or how you know, weight affects risk of disease, we could add all of those variables into our logistic regression model. So in a logistic regression, our dependent variable, again, it's dichotomous. So a one, typically this is how we would code our data. A one would denote that an event happened and zero would denote that an event did not happen. So let's say, going back to our example of cancer, if someone did have cancer, we would designate them as one, and if they didn't, then we would designate them as zero. Um, the independent variable, so on the right-hand side of the equation, so all, you know, the, let's say the response variable, um, in that case, that's nominal, but we can add ordinal variables, we can add continuous variables, we can add any type of variable on the right-hand side of that equation. Um, the only, uh, not consistency, the only thing that is consistent across all logistic regression models is that the dependent variable is a zero or one, or it's binary. Um, let's see. We use, okay, so we use logistic regression um, for a categorical outcome variable because it violates the assumption of linearity in a normal regression. So we can't use just a regular linear regression if we have a binary outcome. Okay, so kind of driving this home, the dependent variable is binary in nature. Um, the independent variables can be categorical, new, numeric, it can be a mix um, of those. And then we talked about this logit transformation of the dependent variable. So there's a, okay, so we, 
transform the dependent variable. And in that way, we now, by transforming it, then we give it this linear relationship with the independent variables. And we also refer to this as the link or a logit link. Um, and then for different types of regression models, we have different types of links or transformations of that dependent variable. Um, and then for logistic regression, we typically need at least 10 participants per independent variable. So that just means if we have, for example, three independent variables that we're interested in and we want to run a logistic regression, ideally we would have at least 30 individuals in our study. Okay. Okay, so the outcome is we're estimating the probability of the outcome occurring. And similar to linear regression, beta naught is our um, intercept and beta one is the coefficient for that first, for the X one, for our for that corresponding um, covariate or um, independent variable. So we can think of it much in the same way as linear regression. And then if you notice, this is probably recognizable, right? This is just the, you know, Y equals MX plus B. Um, so beta naught is the intercept. Um, this is our slope of x1. And this is just the logit transformation. Okay, so when we run um, a linear regression model, we're looking at change in, in the, um, the continuous variable, right? So if like we had a coefficient of two, um, then we would say, you know, for every increase, one unit increase of the independent variable, um, the dependent variable increases twofold. Um, it's a little bit different for a logistic regression. So the measure of association for a logistic regression is what we refer to as the odds ratio. And that's just the odds of exposure among those with disease compared to the odds of exposure among those without the disease. Okay, so if you remember, we had um, the group in our two by two table, we had group. Um, and in this case, it's just exposure or no exposure um, to, to some exposure of interest. Um, you know, maybe it's like an environmental exposure or something like that, or maybe it's a particular drug. Um, and then disease, yes or no. Um, and then we had these cells and we um, denote them A, B, C, and D. And our odds ratio is just the, is A multiplied by D divided by B multiplied by C. Okay. Um, just like in linear regression um, and, and all regression models, the, um, what if it's, if our odds ratio is greater than one, so it's positive, um, it indicates that a change if the predictor variable increases, then the probability of the outcome occurring also increases. So there's a positive association there. If the odds ratio is less than one, what that tells us is if the predictor, as the predictor increases, then the probability of the outcome um, occurring decreases. So there's an inverse relationship there. Okay. So the odds ratio, again, it's the odds after a unit change in the predictor divided by the original odds. Okay. So when we interpret an odds ratio, we would give the um, strength, the direction, and the significance of the relationship. So let's say we had an odds ratio of 2.1 and our Oh, and our confidence interval is 1.4 to 3.2. So how we would um, write that out is, for example, based on our survey, the odds of having a college degree are 2.1 times higher, right? So we're giving the direction. 2.1 is the strength. Then we're giving the direction among men compared to women. And in this case, um, women are the reference group. So it would be like uh, group zero and then men would be group one. Um, this finding is statistically significant. And then we give the 95% confidence interval and that's 1.4 to 3.2. So just a quick note here. Um, Note that we didn't report the p-value. In this example, we've reported the confidence interval. Um, 
most journals, uh, I know in epidemiology, I'm not sure in kinesiology or other um, disciplines, but I know a lot of epidemiologists are sort of moving away from the p-value because remember, it's this sort of arbitrary cutoff. Um, I think people tend to abuse it quite a bit in the literature, right? They, you know, if it's like very close to 0.05, but a little bit over, you know, people will say things like, oh, well, it's borderline significant. It's close to, you know. Um, so I think there's a lot, because of that abuse of the p-value, um, there's been sort of a movement to report the 95% confidence interval um, instead, or at least in addition to the p-value. Um, so this is very common in epi research, um, but, you, you know, I think in clinical journals, like so medical um, journals, like for clinical trials and things like that, there's still a heavy reliance on the p-value. So if you were to write out an interpretation of your odds ratio, um, you might also include your p-value here. We know that the p-value is less than 0.05. Um, you know, you can see here it's statistically significant, but if you were to just ignore that and not say that and just give the 95% confidence interval, we know that the p-value is less than 0.05 because this confidence interval doesn't cross one. So if the odds ratio is one, that means there is no relationship, right? So any change in the predictor variable means there's, there's no, nothing changes in the outcome variable, right? Because it's a one, we're just multiplying it by one. So that means there is no significant relationship. So typically, if we wanted to um, infer statistical significance from the 95% confidence interval, then we would look to see if it crosses one. Um, and if it doesn't, then we can say it's statistically significant. So that's that was my question. If the p-value, oh, we know that the p-value is less than 0.05, and that's why. I think that's the last slide. Okay. All right. So, oh, sorry. Are there any questions about that? Okay. So let me stop share, and then um, I'm going to open up exercise three. All right, let me just Okay. So let me share my screen. Um give you guys time also to open up R. Okay. Oh. Let me open up exercise 2 as well. You don't have to run this with me. I'll just show you and I can send you the code after class. Um, okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, so let's, I'm just gonna cross my fingers because when I was running this last night, I had a lot of issues. Um, like I would try to load ggplot2 and it just kept telling me that it was developed under an older version and it like wouldn't load it, but it was installed. So I don't know. Um, okay, so if you remember um, question five asked us to plot the means and um, also show error bars. Um, and in this case, what that's referring to is the standard error. Um, you could also, plot the standard deviation. Um, maybe in that case, it would be better. Hmm. I don't know. I, I'm trying to think of an instance where I've seen the standard deviation as the error bars, but in this, more typically, we're going to see the standard error. Um, so I'll show you how to go through that. Okay, so the first thing I need to do is load this variable. And again, don't worry, you don't need to run this. I'm just gonna demonstrate it. Um, okay, so I'm creating this object called my sum. So the first thing I need to do in order to plot the means and the standard error. So, <clears throat> sorry, let me refresh. We're plotting the mean uh, sedentary activity for each uh, a race and eth ethnic group. So for whites, blacks, Hispanics, and other. Um, and then their corresponding standard error. 
So the first thing I need to do is take my data set. Um, and if you remember, you know, our NHANES underscore whatever activity, moderate or vigorous um, one is just the full data set, but with the 7777. So the refuse to answer and then the 9999 and the don't know with those individuals removed. Um, otherwise, it can cause problems for some of the functions that we use. Um, so then the first thing I would do is take that data set where I've removed those refuse to answer or do not know um, and calculate the mean and standard error for each group. So I'm creating this object called my sum. Um, I'm taking the data and Haynes um, sedentary one. And then remember, I'm just using this pipe operator to kind of use multiple functions all in, in one grouping. So I'm not creating these sort of interim data sets um, and then kind of messing up. You're just, you know, crowding out the, um, the R um, workspace. So I'm taking that initial data set. So the one up here with those individuals removed, um, I'm indicating what, how I want to group that information. So I want to look at the mean and standard error for these different groups of that variable that we created called new race. And then I'm summarizing. So I'm guessing the person who wrote this function um, does not live in the US. So, you know, it's, it's British English. Um, and then we're taking, we're calculating the sample size. We're, and the mean for sedentary activity, which is the variable that we created up, up above or here. Um, and then the standard deviation. And then we're also calculating the standard error, and that's just the standard deviation over the square root of the sample size. Okay, so once I run that, I will have this my sum object. Um, and if I were to just show you what that looks like, um, it just looks like this. So I have for each group of new race, the sample size in each of those groups, the mean, um, for the mean sedentary activity for each of those groups. This is the standard deviation and then the standard error. Now that I have this object, um, I can then plot my, my bar plot. So I'm taking, so first I'm calculating the midpoint. That's actually gonna help me calculate the error bars. So let me just do that real quick. Okay. Um, okay. So here, if you look on the right hand side, I've calculate, I'm sorry, I'm plotting the means. Hmm. And then I'm going to over actually replot this. I'm going to add um, an X, X axis label, a Y axis label. Um, and then again, for some reason, I have the limit to 425 because this is actually 409 right here. Um, and for some reason it doesn't increase it. So that's something that I, I don't know. I even put it to like 500 and it stayed the same. So I'm not sure what's going on with that function. Um, but okay, so I've plotted the bar plot. So this, the top of these bars correspond to the mean sedentary activity for each of these groups. Um, and then if you see here, I've added um, the x-axis label and the y-axis label. Okay, and now I'm gonna add error bars. So this is just saying the, okay, the start point, so the midpoint of the error bar um, is x0, so that's just the argument, x0. And then I'm pulling in that midpoint that I calculated up here. And then um, y is the lower limit, um, and then again, the midpoint and then y, and then y1 is just the upper limit of our error bar. Okay, code three specifies the kind of arrow to draw and then angle 90 is, so typically the arrow is angled, right? It's like maybe at a 45 degree angle to the straight line. Um, and here we're saying, no, make it angle 90. So make it perpendicular. Um, and that way it's a, you know, a flat bar. You'll see what I mean when I plot it. Okay, so I'm gonna plot that. So right. So if it if I didn't specify 90, it would be like a you know pointy arrows. So the 90 is just telling it to be flat on top and on the bottom. Okay, so that's how we would plot the um, the means and the error bars. So I'll go ahead um, after class and send 
this out to you guys. So if you want, you can try to run that with your moderate and vigorous activity as well. Okay, let me clear that and I'm gonna clear this too. Um, okay, and close that out. Okay, so now let's get back to exercise three. Um, and we left off, we finished question two. So we're just gonna do question three and four. Um, so if you guys wanna open R and, and you know, do this with me, um, I can give you time to do that. Or I don't know, do you guys have R open already? Yes. Yep. Okay, awesome. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so question three says, and I, sorry, I wrote this out in my R, pro, my R script so I wouldn't have to like toggle between word and R. Um, okay, so a coach wanted to investigate the effect of an intervention program and environmental conditions on the recovery of basketball players. Um, he had all subjects in his sample um, run for 30 minutes at 75 to 80% of their maximum heart rate and then immediately undergo these different conditions that he wanted to test. So he had participants undergo three interventions. They had um, aqua therapy, um, relaxation, and massage, and then under two different environment conditions, so hot and cold. Each participant underwent all conditions. Um, he measured their resting pulse rate and then measured the time it took each participant to regain their resting pulse rate after running on the treadmill in the different conditions. Okay, so the three research questions that we want to answer for this, this one is, does the environment significantly affect the recovery time irrespective of intervention? Does the intervention significantly affect the recovery time irrespective of environment? And then is there an interaction between environment and intervention on recovery time? So what kind of test would we use? And let's just walk through it. Okay, so, and I've written it out here, but let me just like go through it with you. So we're interested in two different um, independent variables, right? So we have the intervention program that has three levels. So already we know it's probably gonna be some kind of ANOVA, right? Because it has more than two levels. And then we have these different environment conditions. So that's just two levels, that's hot or cold. Both of these are within subject since each participant underwent all conditions. So remember when we have within subject factors, it's some type of repeated measures, repeated measures ANOVA. And in this case, we have two within subject factors. So it, it would be a two way repeated measures ANOVA in this case. Okay, does that make, does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. So, okay, so breaking it down, that's for me, that's kind of the easiest way to break it down. It's look at your independent variables. What, what kind of variables are they? Are they categorical? Are they continuous? If they're categorical, how many levels do they have? If it's three or more levels, we know it's some kind of ANOVA. And then we look to see whether we have between subject variables, within subject variables, a mixture of both, um, and then that would determine um, whether we need to use a repeated measures ANOVA um, or just a regular ANOVA or a mixed ANOVA. And in this case, we have two within subject variables, so we're, we have a two-way repeated measures ANOVA. Okay, awesome. All right, so let's read in our data. Um, let's see, if you go, the easiest thing for you guys to do if you haven't imported your data already is to go onto the right-hand side here and just import your data that way. And I'm calling it recovery with a lowercase, um, but you can also import it with this. The only thing is you'd have to change your, um, sorry, let me just copy and paste that your working directory. So I think I need to do that actually. All right. So, um, I'm actually gonna do that. Hold on, I'm sec. Okay. Okay, 
let me read in this data. Hmm. That's so funny. Yeah, I don't know. R has been giving me a lot of issues. So I'm just going to click on this. <laughs> and then it worked. That's just so weird, right? Um, OK. Let me know when you have your data set. And this is what it looks like. So we have four variables, our ID variable for each individual, um, the time in minutes that it took for each individual to go from their elevated heart rate to their resting heart rate, um, the two different environment conditions, so hot and cold, and then our intervention. Um, and that was aqua, relaxation, and massage. Okay. So is everyone able to um, open up their data set? It's not like me, but you keep going. Um, were you able to import it or no? No, and it, and it does this every time, but I, I'll, I'll figure it out like halfway through your lecture and then I'll be lost. That's normally what happens. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Let me just give a few more moments then. Let me just, let's see. All right. Maybe, um, let's see, I'm sorry. So I didn't realize that that was happening regularly for you. So if you want, like we can kind of go over it during office hours too. And I can like share screen and all that with you, um, Sebastian. Heck yeah, thank you. Okay, awesome. Okay, so, oh, let's see. You're getting an error with library read Excel. Oh, okay, so. This is probably why. Um, okay, so go ahead and install it first. I think I already have it installed, which is why I was able to load it. Um, so April, you're probably getting an error and you're probably not the only one um, because there's this install read Excel first. Oh, sorry, I meant to do that to everybody. Okay, there. Okay, go ahead and try that first, install packages. Um, if that doesn't work, you can always go to tools, install packages, and then, um, yeah, and my internet's slow too. Um, search for read Excel, and you can install it that way. And then once it's installed, you should be able to load it. Okay. Okay. All right. So is everyone set with um, pulling in their data? Okay. Awesome. Okay. Good. Okay. So I think we may have used this function before ANOVA test. The data argument is um, specifying our data set. And in this case, it's recovery. Um, then we have the dependent variable. Um, and that's um, time in minutes, right? So the time in minutes that it took for individuals to go from their elevated heart rate to their resting heart rate. This is the within ID. So this is telling, you know, what, um, what variable is identifying unique individuals, um, right? Because each person went through this three interventions and then the two environment conditions. Um, so we need to group them somehow. Um, so the within ID is just that ID variable, it's called ID. And then we're specifying our within subject variables. In this case, we have two. So we're using that function C, which stands for combine. And we're saying um, in environment is one of our independent variables and it's a within subject variable. And we also have intervention, which is also a, um, an independent variable and, and it's within subject. Okay, 
So I'm going to run that. I'm going to copy it so you guys have that too. Okay. And then I'll go ahead and run it. Oh, okay. <laughs> One second. This is, yeah, I've been having issues with, um, hold on one sec. Probably some package that I haven't loaded. Um, and I'm glad, actually glad that you guys are seeing this because this is, um, because just so you know that like coding isn't straightforward. So if you're struggling with coding, um, especially when you're coding, like just ad hoc, you know, or just Googling and then trying to use example code um, to paste into your exercises or like work through, you know, whatever for these exercises. Um, and then, you know, at some point in the future for your thesis, um, if you feel like you're struggling, that's totally normal. And like this, this sort of stuff happens all the time. Um, okay, so it's not running because there's some package that I haven't loaded. Uh, so I'm sorry, I'm just on my phone Googling it now, actually. Package. Um, R statics. Okay. All right, so let me just do this first and then once. If it works, I will copy and paste the code for you guys. Um, so that way, let me just make sure this works first before I give you code that doesn't work. Okay. Okay. Okay, awesome. <laughs> All right, so let me copy and post. So it's the package R statics. So all I did was Google um, ANOVA underscore test R function and package. Um, and then it, it tells me, you know, the first or second result told me which package this function is a part of. So this means that it's not part of base R. So go ahead and install R statics and then load that package. And then you should then be able to run this function. And then once you guys have all that, let me just recopy and paste the rest of that code just so you have it all in order. And then once you have that, we'll go over the results. All right, so just let me know when you're ready, when you guys have this um, ANOVA table and R gives you, the function gives you the type three test. Okay, awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna move on. Oh, you cannot find GE, find the ANOVA table. Interesting. Hmm. Do you wanna, Amanda, do you wanna share your screen? I don't think I've seen an error like sure. that before. Okay, let me, oops, no. Okay, hold on one sec. All right, Amanda. All right, so I've made you a co-host, so you can go ahead and share your screen when you're ready. Can you see my screen? Yeah, let me just read it. Oh, okay. Hmm. Okay, can you scroll up in your console? So it looks, I mean, it looks like, it, oh, sorry, on your console, so the bottom half of your screen. 
Okay, so you install. Okay, okay. So I see what you did. Um, so let me send you. So what you'll need to do is after you install packages in line 62, below that, you're going to want to so hit that and hit enter. Oh no, keep that line, sorry. Keep that line. So on line, let's say 63, just say library. And then in parentheses, put um, R statics. You don't need um, quotes or anything. Yep, there you go. So if you run line 63, um, that will load the package. I hate when that happens. I do that a lot. Okay. Okay, I usually hit the run, but how do you do it without hitting it? Oh yeah, so highlight line 64. Mm -hmm. If you highlight it and hit run, it should just run that line. The other option is to hit control enter. Okay, so now I have that. So then should I run this part again? Yeah, so now that function should run. Huh. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, hold on one second. Okay, object recovery not found. Oh, okay. Do you have, okay, so do you see on your upper right hand corner, your data set name, your object is recovery with a capital oh, R? Yep. Yeah, so just go ahead and change it in your okay, code. Right here. Yeah, and then like, um, I know when you import it, R automatically does that because that's the name of the Excel file with a capital okay, R. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. It's yeah, R is a pain with the <laughs> case sensitive. All right. Um, okay, so I will go back and share my screen. Okay. Awesome. So everyone has the ta ANOVA table. Okay. So what we're looking at here in this case is environment and the corresponding p-value intervention, the corresponding p-value, and then the interaction between those two. Um, all of these p-values are highly statistically significant. Um, so there is actually um, a significant interaction between these two. Um, and because of that, um, these do account for that interaction. So um, this is the effect of environment taking into account the effect of intervention as well as the interaction. So there is a significant effect. Um, so if we're going back, sorry, I'm kind of using my cursor on the upper part of my um, script here. So does environment significantly affect the recovery time irrespective of intervention? And that p-value is less than 0.05, so yes, it does. Um, does intervention significantly affect the recovery time irrespective of environment? And again, our p-value is less than 0.05, so yes, it does. And then is there an interaction? And then again, um, that interaction term is down here and that p-value is less than 0.05, so we would say yes, it does. And then just a quick note, um, let's see. Oh no, I talk about it more when we use our next example. So, okay, ignore everything I just said <laughs> about, um, I, I will talk about this, the GES, which is the generalized ADA, ADA, ADA squared. Um, that I'll talk about when we look at our cancer example, because I think it's a really good example um, of this output. Okay, so the fun thing with this exercise is we use four different data sets. So a one data set for each of these four questions, um, which is kind of cool because we get like a variety of studies um, and also um, analyses that we conduct. So let's move on to question four. Um, okay, so this data contains information from a study on the oral condition of cancer patients. Um, and I liked this question um, because I'm a cancer epidemiologist by training. Um, so, um, so yeah, so I'm a little bit biased. Um, I liked this question. 
Um, the purpose of the study was to examine whether an aloe juice treatment could improve oral condition in 25 patients with neck cancer. Um, and neck cancer is actually a pretty awful cancer. Um, so typically patients would have radiation therapy to the neck and it, it also, you know, it causes damage, right, to like normal tissue. Um, and so the side effects of that are pretty awful, um, actually. So, you know, people have a hard time talking and hard time eating when they're undergoing radiation treatment for head and neck cancers. Um, and then sort of just like, not trivia, but a fact is, um, so if you guys have heard of human papillomavirus, so HPV, um, it causes 70% um, of cervical cancers worldwide. Um, so when, you know, typically when we think of HPV, at least in the, you know, cancer realm, we think of cervical cancer, um, which is not a huge problem here in the U.S., but it is a problem in other countries where cervical uh, screening is not as prevalent. So, um, so like the pap smear, that is the reason why we've seen a huge decline in the incidence and mortality of cervical cancer in this country. Um, but there are other countries where pap smear is not as common. Um, it's not as you know um, widely used. Um, and so cervical cancer is still an issue. Um, and then the vast majority of cervical cancers are caused by HPV, so this virus. Um, but, because of screening and because we now have the HPV vaccine, which we've had since 2006, um, and then I believe in 2009, it became available to men as well, um, the cervical incidence of cervical cancer has been decreasing. And what we've seen now, because HPV also causes head and neck cancers, we've seen an increase in head and neck cancer where um, it is now the most common HPV-related cancer. So it's surpassed cervical cancer as the most common HPV-related cancer. So um, if you are less than, uh, if you're age 26 or younger, um, you know, definitely consider getting the HPV vaccine, even if you are a uh, male, um, because it does prevent um, head and neck, um, among other um, cancers. Um, and, and if you're a woman, it would prevent um, cervical, cervical cancer as well as head and neck cancers. Um, so uh, definitely like my older son, when he uh, turns, well, he's 12 now, so he can actually get the HPV vaccine. So at his next physical, um, definitely plan on having him vaccinated. Um, okay, that's a great question, Amanda. So why 26 and younger? Um, so the FDA actually, I believe it was a year or two, maybe two years ago, so in 2019, approved the vaccine for use in individuals through age 45. It's just less effective for individuals older than, say, 26. And it, the reason being is really just, um, you know, at the older ages, most people, um, not most people, more people than, say, someone in their early 20s or their teens are... Um, like 18, 19 are married. Um, and so they're in these monogamous relationships, um, typically, right? Not all marriages are, right? Everyone has different um, arrangements, but in most marriages, um, they would be in a monogamous, you know, sexual relationship. And therefore their risk of contracting HPV is very, very, very low because they have the same partner for this long extended period of time. So it's really just, um, it's really just related to that. So, um, and then ideally, and this is one reason why I would like um, our older son to get vaccinated while he's still an adolescent, is that, so the HPV vaccine is a series of three doses. So, um, so kind of similar, right, to like um, the, um, the COVID vaccine, right? It's two doses. Um, and if you get just one dose, it's effective, but definitely not as effective as if you complete the series and get both doses. So the same thing with the HPV vaccine, it's a series of three doses um, and you have you know, greater and greater effectiveness um, the more doses you have. The cool thing is for adolescents, I believe it's 14 or 15, if they're younger than 14 or 15, they only need two doses. Um, so, so that's one reason why I would prefer, you know, like, if there's the opportunity, you know, to have um, kids vaccinated when they're younger, and that way they just need two doses. Um, so, okay. 
Um, so yeah, so again, like it's the age cutoff is really just a matter of risk where the, the um, you know, the, the benefit of the vaccine kind of diminishes because the risk of getting HPV is so low at that point. Um, but HPV infection itself is actually very, very, very common in the general population. So I think in your lifetime, and this goes for everybody, men and women, I think 95% of individuals will at some point have an HPV infection. Um, the cool thing is our body is able to clear it. Um, naturally, in most cases, um, it's problematic when we don't clear it, um, and that's when it can lead to cervical cancer or head and neck cancers um, or other types of um, genital cancers. So anyway, that's my long spiel. My area is actually gynecologic cancer, so this like then even head and neck cancer is related to HPV, and then that kind of pulled me down a rabbit hole of talking about all these other cancers. So anyway, okay, sorry. <laughs> I really usually carry tell. Hmm. I don't think that, so it's maybe it's likely, but very, very, very unlikely. Um, so typically those viruses would have to be transmitted um, through like bodily fluids. So depending on like how the, like it's possible, right? If it's like there's bodily fluid on the towel and then somehow you get it on a, like a mucous membrane. So even um, like in your like genital area or like your eyes, like your, you know, the, the lower lid, for example, of your eyes, maybe, maybe it's possible, um, but very, very unlikely. So, um, so yeah, I would say highly, highly, highly unlikely. Um, okay, good question. Thank you for all your questions. <laughs> um, that makes me feel better about going down this like tangent. So, okay, sorry, back to question four. We have these 25 individuals with neck cancer. Um, oral conditions were measured and recorded at baseline after two weeks, after four weeks, and after six weeks. And then patients were randomly divided into one of two groups. So here we have ind two independent groups. Group zero received a placebo and then group one received um, aloe juice treatment. Okay, so our three research questions are, is there a difference in oral condition across time? And then there is, the question is, is there a difference in oral condition by treatment group? And this is all like taking into account. So that first question is across time, taking into account the effect of treatment group. And then is there a difference by treatment group taking into effect, uh, taking into account time? And then that last research question is do cancer stage? So staging of cancer is just um, an indicator of how far a cancer has spread. So if it's a very low or early stage, um, for example, like stage one cancer, it would be confined um, to the organ in which it originated. So it would be very, very localized. Um, and then it goes through stage four and that would be considered metastatic. So that means it has spread, the cancer has spread from that or organ of origin to um, distant organs. So for example, if someone had breast cancer, if it was localized, it would just be localized to um, the side of the breast that um, the cancer originated in. So let's say the right side, and then it would be um, a higher stage or a later stage if it then spread to the other side. And then it would be metastatic if it started to spread to like the lungs um, and the colon um, and the brain. So, so stage is really just a measure of how far this cancer has spread. Um, and so the question is asking, does stage or age affect the relationship between treatment group and oral health? And then um, we're being asked to conduct two separate analyses. So looking at stage separately and then age separately. And then again, this is still taking into account the treatment group and then time. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Sebastian. <laughs> I always worry because I know that I have a tendency to kind of go off on these tangents. Um, so at, at least they're like somewhat interesting. <laughs> yeah, I, I loved it. That was okay, good. Okay, awesome. Okay. Um, yeah, we can, oh, I could go even more, but I'll just stop myself because we actually, and uh, Sabir actually, we're like, we have some um, HPV related studies that we're doing. Um, 
So I think just like some interesting stuff going on in the military. Um, okay, so we're let's import <laughs> let's import our data. Um, let's see. All right. So you can go ahead and do that manually. You can go to the lower right hand side, go to wherever your data set is saved and import your data. Um, or if you have your working directory, you can import it this way. And we're loading the package called Haven. So let me just, I'm gonna, sorry. Sorry, if you don't, have it installed. We sh you should because I think we've used it before. Um, but if not, install the package Haven first, then go ahead and load it. And then we're reading this SPSS file called cancer. And then again, if you import it using the, um, the click menu on the right hand side here, um, it's going to name your object with a capital C. So either change it. So let me show you that what that looks like. Um, okay. So if I were to import the data set this way, you can go ahead and change in this bottom left corner, cancer, you can change it to a lowercase c. And then if you see here, it's changed it to a lowercase c there. Um, and that'll just make it easier when we start running through the example. The other thing is you can leave it and then just change this you know, to capital C, for example. Okay, so I'm going to import the cancer data. And then again, like, this is just so weird. Do you see down here in my console, I have view cancer and it's saying like, it can't find that function. But if you look up the, up the in the upper right hand corner, when I click on cancer, it actually runs that function. So I don't know, something funky is going on with R on my computer, um, which might explain why I was having issues trying to graph the means and the error bars using these other functions. Okay. All right, so let me go through, um, we have the, if you look at my view of the data, we have the variable ID, so that's just the subject ID. Zero, one, um, treatment indicates what treatment group they're in. So placebo is zero and one is the aloe juice, um, their age, and then looking at it, it's age in years. Um, this looks like their initial weight. And then looking at those values, I'm guessing that those are in pounds. Um, stage is stage of the cancer. So again, that's one, two, three, four. There's also stage zero, but that's not, um, that's not an invasive cancer. Um, that's like very, like if you've heard of like breast carcinoma in situ or um, ductal carcinoma in situ, um, that would be like stage zero. I think it's you, oh, okay. Uh, it's still, right, like maybe it is. Oh, perfect. Okay, thank you, Megan. I appreciate that. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay, and again, this is a great example of like, if you ever struggle with your code, please never feel bad because like clearly even I struggle with like the very simplest of functions here. Okay, so let me go back to my view. There we go, okay. Stage, and then we have, okay, my, I have like Zoom kind of blocking this. Let me try to see if I can move it. Hold on one second. Okay, there, all right. Total, um, so the oral condition um, at the initial measure, so at baseline, week two, week four, and week six. Okay, so let me close that out. Let me save that. And then while I do that, okay. all right. Okay, so let's break it down just like we did with question three. So we have um, a treatment group that has two levels. 
So, so far we're like, oh, it could be a T test. It could be, um, it could be an ANOVA. Um, and then we have this um, oral condition that we've measured at baseline two weeks, four weeks, and six weeks. So we have um, four time points here. So now we know it's going to be some kind of ANOVA, right? The time variable, so baseline two weeks, four weeks, and six weeks is a we sit, it's a within subject variable, right? Because we're measuring everyone's oral condition at those four different time points. So we have a within subject. So, so far we're like, hey, okay, maybe repeated measures ANOVA, but we also have this treatment, um, placebo or aloe juice treatment, and that's two levels, and that's a between subject variable, right? Um, so we remember we randomized individuals to these two separate groups. Um, so not everyone went through both conditions. So we have a between subject variable, and we have this four level within subject variable. So now we know it's not it's um, it's not just a repeated measures because we have this between subject variable. So we're actually going to use a mixed ANOVA. So remember, mixed ANOVA is when we have a between subject factor and we have a within subject factor. Okay. So for this, um, let's see, for ANOVA test, we actually need our data in the long format, um, which was already done for question three, the data set that we use in question three, um, but that's not the case for the cancer data. So let me go back um, and show you, right? So each of the time points, it's actually they have their own column. So this is a wide format of the time, time variable. So we need to go ahead and convert that to a long format. And this is what we do. So I'm creating this very, uh, this, sorry, this data set called cancer long. I'm starting out with cancer. Um, this gather function, it's specifying, okay, I'm taking this variable time. I'm creating a variable time. I'm, um, I'm looking at the value. Um, it's the oral condition. And then these are the four variables that I'm taking and kind of transposing so that we have a long data set. And then I'm converting ID and time, that new variable that we're creating, um, into factor variables. Okay. Um, so let me copy and paste that. Okay. And then I'm going to copy and paste. This head function is just looking, it just allows you to preview the data. So once we convert this data set into a long format, it's gonna be, there are many more rows to this data set. So this is just looking at the first 50 rows. And that's good practice to preview our data to make sure everything ran correctly. So go ahead and run that. I'm gonna pause for a second. I'll be back in like two minutes. Got it. Okay, sorry. All right, um, was everyone able to run that code? Yes. Okay, awesome. So this is what, so it would be like 40 more rows. Um, I'm looking here in the console at the first 10. Okay, so now you can see we have the ID variable that's still there, the treatment, age, weight, stage, those are all still there. Um, time now is, it's, so you can see like the column names are basically like flipped um, or the, the proper word term for it is transposed. Um, so each of these now um, will indicate what time point the oral condition um, corresponds to. So if we were to look at individual with ID one in the original data set under the total um, initial oral condition column, we would see a value of six. Okay. All right. 
So now that we have that the data set in a long format, then we can go ahead and run the ANOVA test, use that ANOVA test function. So in this case, I'm creating um, a, an object called res.aov, so if you, a, AOV1. So if you remember in question three, we created one that was just called um, res.aov. Um, and I'm going to give it a different name now because I'm running a new ANOVA test on a different data set. So again, that's good practice too, where if you're creating this, um, an object, we're creating a different one. Because if this doesn't run properly, we do still have, like, let's say we just named it res.aov. It will, well, for one, it will re replace the previous object that we created. Um, but also, if it doesn't run properly and we were to then run this get ANOVA table and it was res.aov, just AOV, um, it would give us the ANOVA table that we looked at for question three. And we would be looking at it thinking that, you know, it's the result for question four. Um, so again, that's just good practice to name these different objects, different names. Um, so similar to above, we're specifying the data set, um, the data set that we're inputting. So that's um, cancer long. That's what we created up here. Um, the dependent variable is condition. So if you look in my console, it's the oral condition values. Again, the within ID. Now we have a between subject variable. So that's treatment. Okay, so this is that column here. It's placebo or aloe juice. And then we have our within subject variable and that's time. Okay, so that's this column here. And then we're just looking at the table from our ANOVA result. All right. Okay. Oh, interesting. Okay, so there are missing values in rows 97 and 99, and R automatically removed these for us. So that's good. So that would have been good practice to um, probably to summarize the data first to look at it. Um, so this is nice that this has been worked into this function. Um, okay, so if you remember, um, the first question was, is there a difference in oral condition across time? And if we look at the time row, our p-value is less than 0.05, so we would say yes. Um, and then the second qu research question was, is there a difference in oral condition by treatment group? So we look at this first row here, I'm just highlighting them. And again, our p-value is less than 0.05, so we would say yes, there is a difference in oral condition by treatment group. Oh yeah, sorry, okay. All right. Okay. All right, and then... Um, the third research question, let's see. Okay, the third research question actually requires us to run additional tests. So hold on one second, let's, okay. So let me just backtrack a little bit. Ignore question the part three for now. For questions one and two, we looked at time and we looked at treatment. Time has more than two levels. So remember, after we do these ANOVAs, typically we'll want to do post hoc tests. Um, and in this case, we're going to, so we have times zero, two, four, and six, right? So the post hoc test would be comparing time zero, time two, time zero to time four, time zero to time six, two to four, two to six, and four to six. Okay, so we have those six comparisons. Um, and in this case, they're within subject factors, right? They're measuring oral condition in all individuals across these different time points. So our post hoc tests, in this case, we can use a pairwise t-test. So we have our, um, we're creating this object called time underscore pH for post hoc. We have our long cancer data set, and then we're running um, pairwise t-tests using this function. Um, and then we're um, 
specifying our dependent variable condition, um, and then time. So the different time points is our independent variable. Paired equals true um, because we're running these um, paired t-tests. And then similar to, I believe it was question two, we're using, or we've done it before, um, we're using this adjustment method. In this case, we're using Bonferroni. And if you remember, Bonferroni divides the p-value by the number of tests that we've conducted. And again, I think in our previous example, we had three pair-wide pair t-tests. Um, and so Bonferroni was fine because we have a small number of um, pairwise tests that we're conducting. Um, in this case, we have six different pairs. Again, that's still pretty small. So Bonferroni is still, you know, appropriate. If we started to get into like 50 or 100, um, and in some cases with like these genome-wide association studies, hundreds of thousands of pair, pairwise comparisons, we don't want to use Bonferroni um, because it'd be overly um, conservative. Our p, the p-value that we would need in order to say, a, you know, an association is statistically significant would be incredibly small, um, and we would probably end up failing to reject a lot of um, in truth, um, significant um, associations. So again, we can use Bonferroni here because we have just such a small number of pairwise tests. Um, another common option is the um, benjamini hochberg correction. So we could use that too, um, but in this example, we're using the Bonferroni correction. Okay, so I'm gonna copy and paste that. So these are, our po again, this is our post hoc test for looking at the effect of time on oral condition. Okay. okay, what would we conclude here? So let's look at our table. This is, if you look at group one versus group two, this is initial, the initial oral condition versus week two, initial versus week four, initial versus week six, and so on. Okay. And then in this column is our adjusted p-value. So this is the original p-value, um, and then this is our adjusted p-value with that um, Bonferroni correction. Okay. So we're actually going to look at the adjusted p-value in this case, right? To account for the fact that we have these multiple comparisons. So we saw here, and I'm just kind of looking back at our ANOVA table, that time, so remember with ANOVA, there is a significant effect. So at least one pair is different, but we don't know which one, or if there are more than one, you know, there's more than one pair that is statistically significant. So this is what the pairwise tests are doing. Now it's breaking this down this time to look at the individual pairs. And we can see then from these results, which ones are actually different. So if we look at initial versus weeks two, four, and six, um, all of those p-values are significant, right? So it's less than 0.05 for that zero to two, it's, it's significant for zero to four weeks and zero to six weeks. It's also significant for two weeks to four weeks. So for that pair, it's not significant for um, week two to week six and week four to week, week six. So kind of what I can kind of gather from that, right? So there's a significant change from the start to all these su subsequent time points but not kind of towards the end. So what I'm guessing is most of the change is happening early on in the study, right? In those first two to four weeks. Um, and then we can actually plot that and see that that is in fact the case. So let me just copy and paste this. Um, I'm hoping that there's not like some package that I need to, okay. Yeah, okay, R is being like really funny. Okay, could not find GG box plot. 
All right, so it's some package. Okay, let me go back like, so I don't waste your time during class, but um, I'm sure there's like a package that I need to load to run this. But basically what, we, what we'll see with this box plot is we'll see the distribution of oral condition across time. And you can see that there was most of the change occurred um, in the first half of the study, which is kind of what we expect when we look at these pairwise tests. So I'll troubleshoot that and then like send it to, to everybody. Like once I correct it and post the example code, it'll have that correction in there. So don't worry about that. Um, but I just wanted to, sh I wanted to use this. It's not required for this question, but to show you visually what that change looks like and how it kind of corresponds to the results that we get from our pairwise tests. So, okay. So I'll fix that before I post this as example code. And then what we'll do is we'll, we'll address that third part of the question, which is, um, so two parts, right? In that last one, does age affect the relationship? Um, and then what analyses should we use? So we had this um, mixed ANOVA, and then now we're throwing in this covariate, this continuous covariate. All right, so here I've broken it down. It's mixed because we have one between subject and one within subject factor, right? Our treatment and then time. And instead of an ANOVA, so it's not, in a mix, it's not a mixed ANOVA, now it's a mixed analysis of covariance because we have a covariate. So we've added this covariate um, age, and now we want to look at the effect um, when after taking age into account. Okay, so typically like in cancer research, so the risk of cancer increases as we age. Um, and the same is also true for cancer patients. Once we have cancer, um, you know, the risk for certain out adverse outcomes typically increase with older age. So if somebody who is older gets cancer, um, you know, typically their outlook is not as favorable as somebody who might be younger um, with cancer. And that's taking into account all these other factors that, that play into to the outcome. So like stage, stage of the cancer, type of cancer, that sort of thing. So um, treatment that they may have received. Um, but taking everything into account, typically age does have an effect um, on an outcome, so on, on these cancer outcomes, sorry. So now I'm going to run this mixed analysis of covariance. I'm creating this object and you, you can name this whatever you want. Um, I, and then again, I'm naming it something different from my previous examples. And then let me copy and paste that. Okay, so similar to above, we're specifying our data set, our dependent variable, our within ID, um, the between subject factor treatment, the within subject factor time, and then now we're adding this covariate age. Okay, so go ahead and run that. And then again, it removed those two rows that had missing values. Okay, so the question is asking, does age affect the relationship? And in this case, it actually does not. Okay, so this effect is taking into account all of the, it's like controlling for all these other things. So independent of treatment and time, there is no effect of age. Um, and the, you know, we come to that conclusion because the p-value is greater than 0.05. Okay, once we run through stage, um, I'll go over these generalized eta um, squared estimates. Okay, all right. So then the last part of this question is, does cancer stage affect the relationship? All right, so let me copy and paste that. So I'm basically doing the same thing. The only difference here is I'm including stage as the covariate instead of age. If we wanted to include all of these things, that's when we would get into running um, a regression model. Um, and because we have repeated measures, we might do some kind of um, mixed model 
Um, actually, that would probably be the most appropriate where we'd have a, a, mixed, um, a mixed model and then there would be a different function for that. And that would enable us to include treatment time, stage, age, um, and any other um, covariates or independent variables that we might be interested in. In this particular case, we're treating stage like a continuous variable. Um, so remember stage um, was one, two, three, four. Um, sometimes in some research, we would treat it as a categorical variable. So we might want to look at how risk changes for someone with stage four cancer versus someone with stage one. And if that's what we were interested in, then we would run stage as a um, categorical variable rather than a continuous one. But in this particular example, we're looking at stage as continuous, and I, that's totally appropriate as well, um, right? Because stage one is early stage. Generally, what someone would have a more favorable outcome with an early stage cancer than someone with a late stage cancer. Okay, so let me run that as well, and then we can go through the results here. Okay, so. The question again was, does cancer stage affect the relationship? And that's taking into account treatment and time as well. So it's independent of treatment and time. And if we look at that first row here, stage, we see that the p-value is less than 0.05, right? It's 0 0.000495. So we would conclude that yes, there is an effect of stage. And that's not surprising to me. Age was a little bit surprising, then again, um, we do have a small sample. Um, and I, you know, one thing to look at is maybe how everything else is distributed. Um, maybe we have a very, um, so for example, um, if we looked at how age was distributed, if most people, for example, are all the same age, so everyone's maybe like between 30 and 35, then I wouldn't expect to see very much effect of age because everyone's about the same age. Um, if there was more variability in age, like let's say we had a larger sample and individuals ranged from 20 to 80, um, then we might see that there is an effect of age because there's more variability. And I would expect 80 year olds to not have as favorable an outcome as someone who's let's say 30 with the same type of cancer, same stage of cancer. So all other things being equal, that 30 year old might fare, fare better than the 80 year old on average. Um, but in this case, we had enough variability in stage um, and stage has an, um, enough of an effect that we do get a significant result. Um, okay, so the last thing I wanna do in class, let me just make sure, okay, this is just like notes to myself. Um, I'll leave all this in um, so you can check out the documentation for the ANOVA test function. But what I wanna point you to is the last column here. Okay, so a lot of times, let's say in a meta-analysis or even like within a single study, individuals might look at this. This gives us an effect size. So it kind of gives us the magnitude of effect of these individual variables on our outcome. Um, the cut points for like a small, medium, or large effect vary depending on our study design. So honestly, because we've included all these different variables, we have like a mixed analysis of covariance. In this case, we have um, a mixed ANOVA. Um, in this case, um, or sorry, we have sorry, we have a mixed analysis of covariance in both these cases, um, but we didn't above before we included age or stage, we can't really compare all of those. Um, but within this individual study and within this analysis, we can kind of get an idea. Um, we can kind of compare those values. Um, if we were to, let's say, get look at this column versus um, you know, the results for another study looking at the same thing, um, then we would kind of need you know, an idea of what good cut points are. Um, but that's like, when I was like researching it there, it's like pretty mixed. So let's just limit it to kind of looking at the relative comparisons within this particular study, within this particular sample. Um, 
So this tells us the amount of variability that this variable um, has on the outcome variable. So it explains, um, let's see, 0.06% of the variability in the outcome. So age explains a very little variability. Um, and then you can see even for like time, um, again, it's very little. It's like point, you know, 2.3%. Um, that doesn't mean it's small. Like, so again, like the cut points vary depending on the study design. Um, so really I'm more interested in the relative value of these compared to down here. So if you look, the magnitude um, is a lot larger than the values up here. So stage has a relatively large effect on the outcome. Um, and that's not surprising, right? It has a statistically significant result, um, but I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of where this explains, you know, 25% of the, you know, variability in the outcome versus, right, something like 0.06%. Um, so that's, that's one measure of effect size um, that you can use. If you're reporting, for example, like let's say, um, I can't remember if question four asks you to write like two or three sentences reporting your results, um, that is something that you could report. Um, you could also, you know, very fundamentally, you would want to say that age does not have an effect, cite the p-value, um, stage does have an effect, cite the p-value, um, mention everything else that was in your model. So you had treatment and you accounted for time as well as the interaction between the different variables. Um, those are all things that you accounted for. So age independent of all of these other factors did not have a significant um, effect. So you, that's how you might interpret your results. Um, and I think, let me just make sure. Yeah, okay. So everything, everything that I just said is basically written out in a nutshell here where cut points differ. Um, this is just one measure of effect size. There are many other measures of effect size. Um, and then there's documentation for here um, if you are interested in looking at the ANOVA test function. And I didn't have to Google because there's the package right there that the ANOVA test function is a part of. So. That's actually all I had for class today. Um, we're pretty much done with the core of lectures. Um, there's only really, I think generalized estimating equations is something that I want to share with all of you more maybe towards the end of the semester in case that's something that you might need to use. Um, and I think Dr. Armenta said that we don't cover survival analysis in this class. Um, typically, survival analysis, so survival analysis is also referred to as time to event, um, where you're taking into account person time. Um, that's very common in cancer research, um, but I think less common maybe in the types of studies that you guys conduct. Um, so, so we, you know, we can go over it, but I don't think it's part of the curriculum. Um, so basically what I'm trying to do is kind of share with you the tools that you'll need most in your type of research. Um, and basically we've covered all of that. GEE is, might be something that you need. So we will cover that towards the end. But the remainder of the semester is primarily now going to be focused on getting you guys ready for your final project. So um, if you remember, uh, our final project research question is due on April 13th. That is graded. So these exercises are not graded. Um, if you, it's really, if you need assistance, please send them to me, um, and I, you know, will send them back. Um, I am almost done with a key for all of the exercises, so that I can, you know, give you like standardized feedback on all of your exercises. So I apologize for the delay. Um, but the remainder of the semester will really be working through your own final project. So we do have one final exercise set, um, which we can work through and that will just kind of go over, you know, different, um, different types of tests um, that we haven't gone over so far, um, just so that you have the code for that. Um, and you, you know, you walk through examples um, for those types of analyses. 
Um, and then really what we'll start doing in class is you will have your own data sets and you'll be working independently on your projects during class and I'll be here to assist you, um, you know, if you need it so you can like share your screen with me. So basically kind of like group office hours um, in a sense. Um, so again, April 13th is the deadline for your research question. Um, and that will be part of your final project grade. Um, so please, please think about that if you haven't already. If you need assistance looking for a data set, um, you know, please also reach out to me. I'm happy to help out with that. Um, and then kind of like always, if you have, you know, questions for, you know, with your thesis, for analyses with your thesis, I'm happy to help out with that as well. Um, and you are welcome to use your thesis data um, for your final project in this class, even if you're, you know, maybe your thesis data is incomplete, that's totally fine. You can still run your analyses for your final project here. And then that way you have all your code set up and you can just update it when you have your complete data set. So, so yeah, so there's not gonna be a lecture, pre-recorded lecture, probably till the end of the semester when we talk about um, generalized estimating equations. Um, really, we're just going to be working in R for the rest of the semester. So, um, yeah, so, okay, so we're pretty early on time. Does anyone have any questions about that? The final project? I have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I, I feel like you've talked about this before, but as far as data management goes, you said that R isn't great at data management. So if yeah. I'm using Excel for my data management and I have different categories that need to be recoded to numbers, should I do that in Excel? Or is that something that I know we've done that in R, but um, yeah. do you think that would be easier to do before I analyze data in R? Okay. So I, oh, I have, <laughs> my answer is it depends. Um, if you are re, let's say renumbering, um, and I have feedback, sorry. Um, if you're just like re, renumbering or recategorizing, I would highly recommend you do that in R. Just okay. Because it'll minimize error. Um, yeah. I do know for like another student's project, like the data for each individual subject is on like different worksheets. So in that instance, I actually did just kind of consolidate, like help her consolidate like the different data on each of the different data sheets onto one data sheet, um, okay. because that's just way easier to do in R. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, sense. I mean, sorry, in Excel. Excel, and yeah. Kind of like manipulation of the actual data values, and and so there's like little less room for error. Um, as yeah, unfortunately, R is just it is terrible for data management. I think right um, compared, to, <laughs> compared to the program that I typically use and the program that Sabir typically uses too. So um, <laughs> yeah. Well, that makes more sense. Thank yeah. you. Sorry, sorry. That's probably not the answer you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's fine. <laughs> Okay, you haven't started collecting data since so like, oh yeah, um, you could create, so Amanda, you can create a mock data set um, if you kind of have an idea of, you know, like maybe you already have an idea of your thesis and what that data would look like. Um, if you want to use data sets that any of your advisors have, like from previous studies, like so even if it's a study that's already been conducted and they have a data set that they're willing to share with you, that's totally fine too. Um, and then there are lots and lots of publicly available data sets like NHANES um, that you can also use. Um, so there's survey data that, um, that you can use. And then again, like there are special methods to analyze survey data um, that take into account this very complex sampling, um, but we don't have to account for that for, these, um, for this project. Like, don't worry about that. You can just analyze the data as if it was a simple random sample. Oh yeah, if you haven't done the graphs, yeah, sure. I will send out the code to you. Um, and that way, if you, okay, so some of you have already turned in exercise two. And if you have, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Like, don't feel like you need to go back, make these graphs, whatever. If you haven't turned in exercise two um, and you want to go ahead and plot those um, for moderate and vigorous activity, um, in addition to the sedentary activity, um, go ahead and do that and then send it. So it's really just 
again, these exercises are really just to kind of help you um, use and apply the tools that we're learning in class. Um, so yeah, so again, like I don't want you to feel like you have to go back if you've already turned in exercise two because you're probably not mentally thinking about it anymore. So just don't worry about it. I still will disseminate the example code for those graphs so that you have that code in case you need it um, in the future. Or if you already haven't turned in exercise two and want to include that in the exercise. So yeah, sorry, all wishy-washy answers. Like it just depends. <laughs> Um, okay, so that's all I had. Um, I will post the, the rest of the code for exercise two. So for those plots, the code for exercise three, um, and actually we completed all of that. So there shouldn't be any modification that you need to make. I do need to go back and see why that box GG box plot wasn't working. Um, so I'll fix that first before I post that example code. Um, and then, um, and then that's it. So really what you guys need to start thinking about is, um, you know, not focus on lectures anymore. It's really more focused now on your final project. So, um, so yeah, feel free to reach out to me if you have questions um, and then or and or join me for office hours on Friday. All right, that's all I had.